So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, lunch and uh, we are back uh, to our topic. Uh, my name is Sikura. I work at Charles University at the Institute of East Asian Studies. I'm an economist by profession and Japanologist uh, uh, by, uh, well, by education economist and uh, uh, a Japanologist by profession. My field of studies is Japanese contemporary Japanese society. And uh, today afternoon, we will have uh, the same topic, but taken from uh, the other perspective. And we will focus on uh, the close relations between the four countries uh, as a bloc and as a separate country uh, in Japan. And not only from economic point of view, strategic or military uh, point of view, but uh, from the broader uh, social context. So we will touch uh, the problem of uh, Japanese uh, investors, investment, uh, foreign direct investment in uh, various countries of V4, uh, and uh, also uh, on uh, the uh, well, economic and political relations between a uh, particular country, I mean, Slovak Republic and Japan. Originally, we had uh, four speakers, uh, but due to the coronavirus uh, crisis, uh, our uh, Polish colleague was forced to cancel his participation. So we have time enough, uh, not only for the presentation, but also uh, for the discussion. Uh, well, and the first one is, uh, uh, our colleague uh, Michal Kolmash, who is the assistant professor at the, pra uh, at the Metropolitan University Prague. And his field of study is uh, the political science, and he's particularly interested in Japanese uh, politics. And uh, recently he published uh, an excellent book on uh, the Abe uh, policy and uh, the uh, nationalism. Uh, and uh, it was published by Rutledge in London. Uh, so I hope that he also touch uh, such, uh, uh, well, uh, out of uh, scope agenda in his presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you're right that I'm by profession and training an international relations um, a scholar, or international relations expert. But um, I lived, I've lived in Japan for a few years and I've been going there ever since. Um, now, I was supposed to give a speech about Japan V4 cooperation, which I think is understandable given that I'm from a V4 country. Um, I'm gonna speak a little, and I th was also asked to do it more, let's say, policy relevant than theoretical, so I'll try to make it as policy relevant as I can. I will do a SWOT analysis of strength, weaknesses and um, opportunities, but also um, challenges. And I will be arguing throughout the presentation that um, while there has been an effort to improve the relationship between V4 and Japan, I do not uh, believe that the future is super bright for this framework of cooperation. I think there's more challenges than, than you know, uh, the prospects that we have for this cooperation. But at the same time, sure, there is um, some, you know, some validity of, uh, or some improvement in the Japan V4 format. Um, so, Let's see if this works. Yes, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of um, an overview of Japan V4 coordination or V4 cooperation. And this cooperation is quite old. Um, not V4 Japan, but Japan with countries of the V4 group. Um, now, we celebrate 100 years of you know, Czechoslovakian um, Japanese relations. The Slovaks celebrate the same thing in Slovakia, obviously. Um, the Polish, I believe, they celebrated it last year because it was 1919 when they started official relations a few um, moments before uh, the Czechoslovakians uh, started their own official relations. I was in Hungary f a few weeks back for a conference, and they said they are celebrating 150 years of cooperation uh, between Austria-Hungary and Japan. So I thought it was quite unique, you know, for, you know, it was like the beginnings of the, of the Meiji era after the restoration. So uh, that's, that is some, some history and uh, with Austria-Hungary, like uh, quite shortly after Japan started with, uh, with formal diplomatic relations with European countries, they, uh, they started with Austria-Hungary as well. So I guess this was something that we could have built upon, but, you know, like throughout those I don't know, 100 years, um, the relations were rather shallow um, for most or for all countries of the V4 group. Um, 
I guess it's quite understandable. Um, they were somewhat improving during the First Republic, like until the, f until the Second World War. But well, because of the geographical distance and also lack of common interest, the cooperation uh, didn't really exist much. Um, it existed in some cases, as for the Czech Republic, for instance, and existed um, in opposition to Russia, for instance, or to Russian influence, um, because our soldiers had similar missions uh, in Siberia. Um, and uh, there were quite some Czech engineers and, and artisans and, you know, like culture and voice to Japan that helped quite a lot to foster cultural relations between, between Czechoslovakia and Japan, but these relations were quite shallow. After the Second World War, obviously, um, Czech Republic and 12 well, V4 countries falling into the communist bloc didn't help the relations very much. Uh, because uh, while Japan was interested, generally interested in cooperating with European states, um, they were more interested in cooperating with the Soviet Union than with the parts of the Soviet system. Thus, even though the relations were improved or restarted after the war in 1950s, mostly, uh, with, with all the V4 countries, Czechoslovakia and the two other countries. Um, the relationship, again, until the, the end of the Cold War was rather superficial, uh, was rather superficial. Since um, the end of, um, of the Cold War, uh, we mark a new era of Japan V4 relations, but the, we still can divide it into two parts. The first one was pre-EU accession and the second one was post-EU accession. And it's quite visible, and I think it's very important for the V4 group, that post-EU accession relationship between, uh, between Japan and V4 was much broader, much wider, and much more complex than the pre-EU accession. And I don't think this is a coincidence. You know, I think that the fact that we are members of the EU is very much a driver for Japanese, um, Japanese um, you know, motives uh, for cooperating with the V4. Now, you can see Suzuki, uh, Suzuki plant that was constructed in Hungary, was it 1989, I think? It was like right after or even before uh, the revolution, something around the revolution. The Hungarians were always been very proud of it. It employs um, like 5,000 um, Slovak workers because it's on the border between Slovakia and Hungary and was like one of the good examples of this like new wave of Japanese investment into European countries. Obviously, the V4 countries were, um, well, popular in general, they were popular for Japanese investors because while they had skilled labor, they had low costs of labor, which is something that continues today, um, even though well, the cost of labor is a little bit higher, but still it's not as high as compared to, for instance, Britain or other Western European countries. Um, in the 1990s, you can see that the levels of Japanese investment into V4 countries have expanded quite a lot, reaching a peak around the crisis in 2008 and falling and then, you know, coming back again, um, which I guess it's great. It's, um, it's more or less, well, except for Slovakia, it's, it's, more or less, uh, it's more or less similarly, you know, divided between these three countries. Maybe, I'm not quite sure about Slovakia, maybe you can tell us a little bit more, but uh, it, it, I guess it's because the, the country is a little bit smaller than the others. But, um, but in general, there was some investment or starting investment into, into V4 countries during the time until the accession in 2004. Uh, since 2004, you can see the, the, the graphs spiking very much and the, the investment spiking very much. But also since the pre-accession talks, and I do, I do believe that this is important, since the pre-accession talks to the EU, the political cooperation expanded very much between Japan and the V4 countries. So, uh, yeah, might, you might remember uh, Prime Minister Koizumi coming to the Czech Republic and Poland um, in 2003 and signing first um, strategic partnership or joint stand statement towards strategic partnership, it wasn't strategic partnership, of course, but the joint, um, joint, uh, joint statement, which set up the framework for the, for the V4 plus Japan framework that you know, we are sort of continuing right now. Um, even though Koizumi was uh, more open to coordinating relations with the, with the V4 countries, um, when Shinzo Abe came to power, uh, he was sort of unimpressed about the progress of the V4 Japan cooperation. And it's quite true that even though there were some political proclamations about how we need to cooperate with Japan, the tangible political um, outcome of that was rather non-existent. You know, it was still a lot of like 
talk shop rather than any effective action. There were investments, sure, but investments were driven, I believe, by you know the viability of Czech and well V4 work market rather than by political you know political needs or you know like to fulfill some form of uh, Japanese political agenda in Europe. So yes, there were companies investing in the Czech Republic, mostly car companies, but you know now we can see a lot of other investment as well. I guess you all drink Pilsner beer, so you know for yourself how it hasn't changed at all, which is great. Um, but uh, the political coordination has also um, expanded um, quite uh, quite a bit uh, under under Abe's leadership. Now, Abe's foreign policy was the arc of um, freedom and prosperity, and then later the proactive contribution to peace, which again, I believe uh, you are well aware of, of um, which means that Abe tries to engage the world more I guess, so that Japan could have larger presence in international relations, not only in Asia, but also in, I mean, in East Asia, but also in Central Asia, um, in Africa as well, by building the Djibouti base, but also in Europe, you know, in, in Eastern Europe and in European Union per se. You know, the relationship with the European Union, I think it's quite important for Japanese foreign policy. Now, I again, again, I believe that in this framework, we have to understand the relationship between Japan and the V4, you know, within the framework of the European markets, within the framework of the European integration, within the framework of the European Union, the organization. Um, in this sense, um, in this sense, Abe's built, you know, he's expanded on his foreign policy towards V4 countries, and he uh, he continued with Koizumi's um, expansion or Koizumi's um, foreign policy towards V4. He restarted the Japan V4 framework through the first summit um, in, in Warsaw in 2013, then the other summits in 2018 in Bratislava and in 2019 in, where was that? 2019 was Bratislava, and the one was before that was, I can't quite remember, but it was in a V4 country, I think it was in Poland. <laughs> uh, well, the, the, the thing is like uh, Shinzo, Shinzo Abe's um, um, policy towards V4 is quite predictable. I think it's long term, it's based on the ideas that we can perceive. Um, it got stopped a little bit before 2012 uh, because of, well, first DPJ came to power, Democratic Party of Japan, which made it a little bit more confusing to understand Japanese foreign policy for us. Um, and second, uh, because of, you know, 311 and the sort of like changed uh, Japanese interest into within of Japan rather than that much of an outside of Japan after the catastrophe and the tsunami happened. So this was why um, between um, around 2000, 10, 2011 and 2012, 13 didn't almost nothing happened um, in terms of the V4 coordination. But after uh, Abe's second term in power, it, it expanded again. Now Abe's V4. Uh, this this is a phrase from the from the Warsaw summit Japan V4 or, um, um, you know document uh, outcome uh, that speaks very much about universal values and principles, which is something that a lot of arc of prosperity and ideas of what arc of prosperity and freedom is based on on ideas, on Japanese promotion of ideas, you know, as its ground stone for foreign policy. Um, now, I'm quite critical about this, about the, 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 the you know, the, the, if, I'm not quite sure just how much we can, we can believe that this is the only intention that Japan has in its foreign policy. And well, some of the Central European states were, f felt a bit uneasy about Japan promoting ideas and values and rule of law, but then cooperating with the Russian Federation very much, you know, then right next to us. And, you know, like for us, this was quite like, sh should we really believe that things that Japan is doing, it's, you know, trying to, or is it just something that tries to persuade us to cooperate it, uh, with it more closely? Um, in any case, the documents that we signed at this meeting and the meetings after that stress the necessity to cooperate, the normative basis of this cooperation based on ideas and values, and uh, expanded the scope of this cooperation um, into um, into scientific cooperation, into the um, into ODA, official development assistance, um, into you know Japanese overseas markets. So there is coordination on the ODA of, of V4 and Japanese um, investment. Um, there are consultations on, on environment, for instance, as the first one in 2013 was about the COP in Paris, but after that, the Conference of Parties, we coordinate our policies to other COPs in the UN um, uh, framework for combating climate change. 
Um, we talk a lot about security as well, and it's, it was quite uh, intriguing for me to see that at these summits, Japan talked a lot about abduction issue. Why did Japan talk about abduction issue to V4 countries? You know, I, I mean, it's obviously understandable and very important issue for the Japanese. But the you know the abduction of Japanese citizens by North Korea, which is a big issue for Japanese foreign policy. But I wasn't quite sure how we as a V4 country can contribute to that. But um, this is part of it. I'm, I'm just using it to show how this sort of narrative or this like common position of the V4 Japan expanded. Um, and I guess it got also a little bit more symmetrical. You know, before that, before accession to EU and before 2012-13, the relationship was quite unsymmetrical because it was really a relationship of Japan investing into V4 countries rather than any political coordination of these actions. So this is this got better. This got better. There's more of like political symmetry among these countries. But there is still, um, a, I would say, weak and shallow nature of these relationships. Even though, though they are broader, they are not institutionalized, they are ad hoc, really, and they are sort of like based in, uh, in political proclamations that both of them or all of the countries can agree. Now, I do believe, however, that there are some possibilities and prospects for this diplomacy or for these relations to get better. Um, the, a lot of them are dealt or done with the ongoing shape of the European Union, um, um, which, you know, has lost Britain as, as one of its key members. And I think there is some positivity or optimism, or that's what I learned, that there is some optimism about the possibility of Japan cooperating with V4 more, or that even V4 might, might emerge as one of smaller, I guess, smaller centers of, of post-Brexit EU. I don't think this is going to happen at all, because I don't think that V4 is capable of coordinating their actions within the EU so much, and also because there is a lot of uneven interest of the V4 countries within the EU framework. But still, there was interest um, or, let's say, optimism about uh, that uh, Britain leaving the EU might lead Japan to transfer some of its investments into the V4 countries, right? So this, I think, is my one prospect, optimistic prospect that we can get. Um, another one, obviously, and this is all in the framework of the EPA and SPA that, that uh, Europe, European Union signed with Japan. I think this is a great achievement that the European has been working very hard for a long time to, to do it with Japan. Um, and, and in this sense, I agree with you, Professor, that this is this. I, I would be very surprised if this was overturned by ben, Bernie Sanders or anyone else taking the chair from Donald Trump, you know, in the United States. Um, there is also some optimism in forms of um, cooperation in defense or let's say military matters because you know v4 is organizing them itself into form of joint defense coordination within the v4 battle groups you know battle groups which means uh, joint investment and joint trainings of v4 groups together but um, this is something that japan with its new proactive contribution more let's say military presence around the world could use you know as sort of like ally or coordination point um, in its foreign policy. But again, as I'll say in a second, I don't think this is this is going to go very, very far, you know, this 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 form of coordination. Um, and I guess there is a prospect or optimistic prospect about that. Well, since 2012, we expanded the political framework of our coordination. Maybe we can keep on doing that in the future. Again, I don't think it's going to happen very much. But now let's uh, why let's look a bit about why I'm not very optimistic about the institutionalization or further institutionalization of the V4 framework. Um, I have like four ideas or four challenges to it. Um, the first one is that there, I believe there is a huge difference in V4 strategic cultures, which means that there is no real cohesiveness in the group um, of Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, and, and, and Hungary. I think that our interests within and outside of, the, of Europe are quite different. Um, and I um, do believe that this sort of like, and this is like my, my more like general comment, not only in relationship to, to, to Japan, I think this hampers any possibility of our further integration within a V4 format. Um, so this is the first thing. Um, the second thing, as I believe, is, well, I think Japan understands V4 as a block, but as a block within the EU. And I do think that this might have some similarities to, to China's position or China's policy to Europe as well. But um, if, um, if, 
it's my opinion here, if um, we would be on the fringes of the EU, I think the Japanese interest in coordination its relations with V4 would be much smaller. You know, if we would be a driving force or one of the centers of the EU integration and coordination, I think the Japan would be much more inclined to coordinate our relationship with us politically, um, because it would also help to gain leverage or to gain, you know, uh, acceptance within the EU framework. Uh, if we are on the fringes, which very much seems so right now, well, maybe not us per se, but you know, Hungarians have been blocking a lot of common positions on the European on, on Asian affairs. Um, I don't think that this is going to help our relations with Japan very much. Um, third thing is um, uh, there is almost no development to the defense coordination within the V4 program, the V4 format, this battle group thing that I've been talking about, um, which is basically because first there is, um, like what the main reason is there is lack of money, money, money in it, right? So if there's not much money, I don't think the cooperation is going to, you know, progress very smoothly. Um, uh, which means that, you know, like this sort of like defense optimism or optimism possibility for defense coordination is, um, is quite questionable whether it can be sustained, you know, over a long period of time. Uh, this really basically depends on the level of integration of defense policies of V4 countries. Um, the last one I could think of is, um, is the role of China. And you know, when I was in, in Hungary, there was a conference about Japan's foreign policy to, to, to Europe. Um, but we spent like at least 60% of the time speaking about China, maybe even more. It was just all China, China, China. Um, well, I guess it's understandable, obviously. Like if you look at newspapers here, you can hardly find Japan in them. You can very much find China in them, even though there's almost no substance to it. Japanese investment in the Czech Republic. Japan has been the second largest investor in the Czech Republic for a decade, at least a decade now, you know, doing large investments. Uh, China, no, not, not even comparable to that. I was even, it was even, I was even more struck that, uh, that in Hungary, you know, uh, Japan was number now it was two uh, because Korea overtook it uh, as an investor into, you know, into its um, in, into its economy. Um, but Hungary has such a pro-China policy, pro-China foreign policy that I had I really couldn't see any substance within this policy. And this is something that I can find a little bit in Czech discourse on um, Asian relations or on you know relationship with with China and Japan. And I can't can't really understand it much. I think that it would be better to focus on Japan because, um, or focus on Japan a little bit more because there is quite some substance into the coordination or cooperation in, in terms of economy. And even in terms of values, even though we might question uh, Japanese sincerity in promoting these values, in a sense that because Japan is very much okay with cooperating with basically anyone in the world, well, and of course not, not North Korea or China, but, uh, but in, in general, uh, in general, I, obviously, we are much closer in terms of values to Japan than we are to China. So, in a sense, um, um, in a sense, I. Uh, but you know, like this sort of like over um, exaggeration of Chinese influence in V4 probably might not help uh, help organize our relationship with Japan very much. Um, I personally. Um, my, my, I personally cannot quite see. This is my last slide. I cannot quite see. Um, uh, the future for uh, institutionalization of this framework, similar to how China is doing with the 16, 17 plus one with the European countries, Central and Eastern European countries, um, unless um, some more development of V4 policy within the EU framework happens. Now, if it does, I can see this coordination, you know, sort of progressing quite smoothly, um, because again, there is not much of a trick of a friction, you know, within the coordination. There's just not much interest in the coordination, right? But there's not much of a friction between between V4 countries and Japan. What I would recommend the V4 countries to do, um, and again, I'm just a you know just a you assistant professor at the university. I'm not a policymaker. I've never been, so it's just really like lame recommendations by a young guy. Um, now, I think that we should stop undermining EU position, especially in terms and in questions of East Asia, which would help, or that we should actively promote EU position on East Asia, um, on China, uh, on, on Japan as well, but in general, in, 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 in EU's um, external action service or EU's foreign policy guidance, uh, because this might help our relationship with Japan. I'm, I'm believe, I believe that. Um, I also believe it would be possible, it would be great to come to some form of diplomatic settlement 
segment of Japanese investment in V4 countries, as it sort of happens happened with the Suzuki, you know, where both Slovakia and Hungary are invested in this coordination. I think that this is quite problematic. It's very problematic because, well, every of those, you know, V4 countries wants to attract the investment by itself, right? And you are more like competitors than an organization. You compete for Japanese investment into your country. If there was a political framework which could, in which those V4 countries would cooperate to invest or, you know, some somehow engage Japanese investment um, on, let's say, some form of diplomatic um, coordination level, it would be great. I think this is very problematic. And it, I can't quite see this happening anytime soon. Uh, still seems to me that these V4 countries are more of like economic competitors than allies um, in a relationship with Japan. Um, third, I do believe that uh, that general V4 integration, if it would be happening, something that we saw with the battle groups, for instance, if it would happen more, it would make V4 as a block more um, attractive to Japan. But uh, it's quite questionable whether this can happen. I mean, there obviously are closer ties and more dialogues between Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia and Hungary. But um, I, I'm, I'm it's quite questionable. I don't quite believe that they lead or they are um, forming, um, you know, uh, let's say institutionalized, very close sort of partnership or institutional block. Um, the fourth <laughs> recommendation is that we shouldn't pay too much attention to China. And well, perhaps uh, this is um, this is just very idealistic. I know I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know whether it can happen. Uh, I just believe that more realistic foreign policy based on substance than on ideas of future grandeur, which might or might not happen, would be more beneficial in terms of coordination the relationship with Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Michal, for your very detailed and uh, thought-provoking uh, SWOT analysis of uh, the contemporary state of uh, uh, We4 Japan uh, relations. I do not intend to summarize your uh, your presentation. Uh, so uh, the floor is open. We still have time enough uh, for a discussion, for the questions, or for comment. Uh, so, uh, Ruda. Is there any mic over there? Yeah. Thanks a lot, Michal. I am, you know, I, am, I deal with Chinese affairs, so I cannot, I cannot help myself to avoid being, uh, you know, <laughs> obsessed. So that's why of my, my, cra my crazy way of thinking, of, of, of course, my, must point to Warsaw, and uh, this is the epicenter of the. <laughs> China diplomacy, especially the, the format 16 plus one, uh, ambitious in liberal internationalists, uh, Tusk and Sikorsky. They were the main main politicians that time who pushed forward the, the Asian or Asian policies and uh, the, the 16 plus one format was established 12, 12, uh, 2012, and next year was uh, V4 plus plus Japan. So we, we can see the obvious analogy. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 I'm aware that, that that Japan and China are very very different uh, stakeholders, and that this is very difficult to to compare this. But still, I I would identify the Ch the Japanese efforts to. To just to follow the, the Chinese diplomacy, not to not to the, the, not to lose space there and lose and lose the uh, let's say uh, East European uh, uh, small states in their favor. Well, I, I would just uh, uh, if I try to dig dig deeper of the uh, uh, big Asian economic powers and their policies in post-communist Europe. Uh, uh, Koreans, South Koreans are very, very active too, and Chinese. So I, I, would, I would trace analogies be between those three. How, how about the Chinese, uh, excuse me, the Japanese uh, investments in Baltic states and, and uh, Balkans, and especially in Balkans, because I, f I feel this is now the the shift of the focus of, of the investment uh, uh, search of, of the of the of the Asian Asian uh, uh, you know uh, uh, economic powers. Can we can we compare the uh, 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 geoeconomic uh, 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 relevance of Balkans for for the Japanese to compare with with the with the, with the Chinese? 
at, at, I, I don't think that, it, that the Japanese would be competing in build up of the on for the transportation infrastructure, but still the uh, destroyed Yugoslavia and, and those states they, they are they are hungry for for uh, for investments are the Japanese active there too in in in, uh, in uh, Balkan states thank you uh, I would be very happy to leave this question to our foreign direct investment experts, but before expert here, but before I do, um, it's obvious that you said that, for instance, in Serbia, the Chinese influence is very much, very much present. And um, I'm not quite sure whether Japan is trying to rival China or, you know, like contain China in Europe. It might be the case. The 2013 summit was a 10th anniversary of the original summit in 2003 that started the coordination. So it started 10 years before that. Um, but y you're right that obviously like for, for, for Shinzo Abe, this China, China rise is a grave motivation for his, for his foreign policy outside and inside of Asia as well. And I am pretty sure that some form of Chinese power or strengthening Chinese power might be some incentive or more incentive to, you know, to come and do this sort of like diplomatic incentives. And I guess this is the case of the arc of prosperity and of, of the proactive contribution to peace as well of these concepts. Um, with uh, with with the Balkans, I, I well, Balkans was part of V4 um, V4 Japan format in a sense that Japan wanted to coordinate European policy towards Western Balkans with and within this V4 format. So they discussed it with us. They discussed it with the V4 countries and they discussed it with the EU level as well. Um, I do believe that there are some investments in the Balkans, but again, I'm just going to leave it here to to go. Maybe, maybe additional, sorry. Um, reply. I think uh, Toyota Motors, they are establishing assembly plant in Serbia soon, this year or next year, I think. Then um, Baltic country is more, uh, just uh, I came back from Estonia last week, actually. Um, it's a Baltic, Estonian case is the Japanese FDI. It's a more like a subcontracting type of FDI. Is a, for example, Dentsu is a, one of the biggest advertisement companies. They hired all econometricians <laughs> to analyze British market, much cheaper labor cost, and they have a quite a good IT skill. So this, this type of investment are located in Baltic country. Then some like a labor intensive industry are shifting actually V4 country to cheaper labor cost country, including Ukraine, Moldova, Romania, and Serbia too, Serbia or those Balkan states too. So that's a shift. Then in terms of a competition with China, it's a contents of investment are very different between Japan and China. Chinese investment are not like a greenfield investment. Um, which create the jobs, technology transfer, just that they are buying properties. Or in case in Czech, is buying a football club, biggest one, probably biggest investment. So it's, it's in this time, it's, a, I would say, quite different role we have. It, so that's, that's my sorry, um, reply. Well, thank you. Uh, for this precious comments on uh, the Japanese investment activity in uh, not only in V4 countries but in uh, so-called former uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So any other comments or questions? Or just an idea? Yeah, please, Professor Hosoda. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mihal, for a very clear presentation. Just I would like to add to your presentation. During your presentation, you wonder why uh, Japanese side asked the uh, abduction uh, issues during the summit. I, I think there, is, there are two reasons. One is the Czech Republic and Poland has official diplomatic relations with North Korea. Yeah, right? Yeah, and for example, uh, as far as I know, uh, current leader Kim Jong-un's aunt, Kim Jong-pil, is a Czech, um, uh, North Korean ambassador in the Czech Republic, right? So in the sense, this kind of influence the Japanese side calculate. And also, another reason is the North Korean uh, uh, diplomats and also the espionage, these uh, humans uh, quite actively uh, attract and buy, or try to buy the Czech and the Polish and the Hungarian retired tanks, spare parts, and so on to export to North Korea. So that's why 
the Japanese side want to prevent this kind of you know, transfer of the technology through the, these occasions to uh, rise the abduction issues. Right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You're right. We were the members of the commission that was supposed to oversee the implementation of peace agreement within North and South Korea, uh, which lasted. Uh, we were the members until 1993, where Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia split into Czech Republic and Slovakia, and we were not members since, but Polish are still members of this commission. And Czech Republic has an embassy in North Korea, which means that we have some sort of political leverage towards North Korea. In this sense, I, I thank you for that. I do understand this, this motivation, the Japanese motivation for it now, uh, for it more. And I think that we've been quite, um, quite active in um, gathering information and providing our allies with information based on the embassy that we have in North Korea. So yeah, th thank you for that. Well, so any other question or comments? Well, I have one very simple question or some comment. Uh, in, you just provide us very uh, well, uh, easy to understand uh, recommendations, uh, even uh, as a young <laughs> non uh, policymaker, a young scholar. But uh, definitely, in the first part of your presentation, you just introduced us how the uh, relations or cooperation between Japan and we four countries was built since the 90s. But uh, the general image is that it was the Japan who was the, the driving force be, behind this, uh, well, cooperation building. Uh, so could you uh, just, or could you uh, explain or just sketch uh, the role or activity of the we four countries? So if we turn uh, the title of your presentation, Japan we four before, or Japan we four cooperation, just when we turn it, we four Japan and, uh, cooperation. So uh, the, we four countries was completely passive in this first, uh, I mean, stage of uh, the uh, relations building, or there were some activities on, say, Czech or Poland or we four countries as a bloc. Uh, yeah. I, I do not believe that we were passive. I think that we, of course, we were uh, interested in gaining uh, Japanese investments into into V4 countries. You know, after the revolution, I'm pretty sure of that. I also believe that there was a lot of cultural cooperation that was happening, that was sometimes maybe even originated by the V4 countries, um, because you know this was ongoing even before the 1990, even before the revolution. The cultural cooperation was existing, and I think that Japan was quite fast to acknowledge the formation of the new states, which also was very highly perceived in um, among Czech politicians, such as you know Václav Havel was a you know great great admirer of, of Japan and went there many times invited the, the emperor to come to I believe you were there, right? Yeah. <laughs> you were translating for them uh, at the time, and and other people, um, especially from like the, this this entourage uh, around Václav Havel. So I know that in the in the Czech Republic there was quite some intention to to cooperate with Japan. Not quite sure about about the other countries within the V4 bloc, but I would be surprised if they weren't interested in you know like cooperating or gaining Japanese investment there. Maybe you can you know add to it if you want. And do you mean that now we are more proactive? Uh, uh, for example, when thinking about the, the, uh, the plan to invite uh, Prime Minister Abe or a Japanese emperor to official visit to, to Czechoslovakia, so is there more interest on our side than on their? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. I mean, uh, we have a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the section of East Asian Affairs, which I believe is great and uh, very active in, um, in, in, you know, in, in foreign policy organization with, with East Asian countries. Um, and yes, well, the discussion about inviting Prime Minister to, to, to Czech Republic in 2020 has been ongoing for like at least a few years now. And um, I think there is quite some interest on our side to do that, especially given like the recent investments into the Czech Republic, you know. Um, so I, I, I personally do not think that we are like super proactive in attracting that. I guess it's part of our, you know, East Asian agenda that we are sort of continuously pursuing for some time now. Um, but uh, I think that quite more is doing done, you know, um, within the ministry that we can see on the outside. So in a sense, yes, I think that maybe we are more uh, doing, you know, in terms of attracting Japanese uh, Japanese. Um, politicians or investment uh, policies um, to, to V4 countries that, uh, that is apparent. In a sense, yeah, I think so. Thank you. So any other comments or questions? Well. And just put one technical, uh, uh -huh. technical remark. That the group of the unidentified four languages were the first group of the Shekhar four. So when they say the Shekhar language, 
I think that this is the key role on political and economic mm -hmm. relevance of Poland because this is still uh, the biggest biggest country. Uh, Slovakia is is too small. Hungary with with all Prime Minister or Orban it's somehow weird. Czechia it's not big enough. And mm -hmm. Poland this is this is really the ambitious. Uh, this is really this is quite a big big uh, European state. So I believe that there is a hierarchy in in, in the view of, of the Asian state that they 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 put put stress on Poland and that means the whole whole region. This is my hypothesis. Just well, unfortunately, we are missing our Polish colleague. <laughs> she or he would explain it in detail. I agree, and I also believe that Polish is, the Polish are maybe a bit more open to well, countering China's presence than, for instance, the Hungarians are. So even within, you know, like Japan, Poland, Polish cooperation, I think it's quite okay in this sense, in terms of like shared interests. I mean, that even in Poland, they are, I mean, uh, very good in institution building. Sure. Yeah, when you look, for example, at the university who provide the Japanese uh, studies program compared to Czech or Slovak mm -hmm. or, or to Hungary, so a completely different level. Mm -hmm. Well, so if there is no other uh, comments, we, we also have the, uh, the closed remarks, so if you have in mind uh, some other uh, questions, so you can just ask in the very end of our meeting. Uh, so thank you once again, and we will move to uh, the uh, other speaker, Professor Natsuda. Uh, Kaoru, uh, who is uh, the professor of uh, management uh, at the APU, uh, Asian Pacific uh, University, which is a part of uh, one of the uh, largest uh, private uh, Japanese university, Ritsumeikan University. And uh, nowadays he is uh, active here in Europe as a visiting uh, professor of uh, Budapest uh, Business School. He will uh, deliver uh, the presentation on uh, the Japanese investment into uh, the V4 countries and particularly uh, to uh, Czech Republic. And good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Kaoru um, Natsuda. Then, um, as uh, Professor Shikora mentioned, actually, um, I'm from Hungary at the moment. So I'm visiting professor at the Budapest Business School. Then, and more importantly, I was a former visiting scholar at the Charles University here in 2015 to 2016. Um, so first, first of all, I want to express my um, gratitude to the Institute of International Relations and the Japanese embassies for arranging this um, conference. And uh, I'm very happy to be back in Prague. So then today I will talk about the Japanese FDI and the management transfer to Czechia. Then I will talk about a bit more mi micro issues, corporate, like uh, management issues in Czech Republic, case of like a uh, um, Japanese company. Then, uh, firstly, this is an um, overview of Japanese FDI. This is a number of companies which are operating in V4 countries. So Poland is the biggest number. They have th over 300. Then Czechia, 279. Mm -hmm. Then Hungary and Slovakia. Then also Japanese government office, it's a JETRO. It's a three country exist, Czechia, Poland, Hungary, but not Slovakia. Slovakia is not really still attractive country for Japanese company, actually. Then this is a Japanese FDI. Only this is a, like a Czechia and Hungarian case. And this is a net flow of the Ministry of Finance. So um, after Lehman shock, FDI flow become negative, but uh, after 2013, about then both country increase. That's a uh, then biggest like a uh, change. For example, was 2012, both country were negative. Is a uh, Hungarian case. Is a uh, for example, Sony left country, a uh, TDK another company. Then Czechia, some company also left from the market. Then this is a recent like uh, FDIs in V4 country, but not sorry um, Slovakia. 2017 and the 18s, Czechia is automotive related investment are quite common. Then Poland 
also like uh, automotive related, but also 2018, like uh, Poland attract more investment, diversified investment than the other, the other country, which are like uh, including food processing industry. For uh, example, this is a, Takaokaya uh, is a seaweed producer. Then sometimes they produce like a Chinese type of dumpling company are producing, for example, food processing or chocolate. Chocolate company was, this is a not green field, but a brown field taken over by Lotte, for example, chocolate company in Poland. The Hungarian case are more also automotive related industries. Then before I talk about these Japanese issues, like uh, there are lots of questions. So I have to, maybe I will talk about a bit of FDI difference between Japan, Korea, and China. China, Japan, uh, we had a question. So Chinese investment, generally speaking, is not a green field investment. So just that they make investment in uh, properties or mostly properties, I guess. Then that's counted as a statistic investment. Then on the other hand, Japanese and Korean investment are mostly green field investment. Green field meaning is a start from scratch, nothing. Buy land, build factories, create employment, then um, technology transfer. That, that's a, like a Japanese and a Korean investment. Then difference between Japanese investment and the Korean investment. Japanese investment history is much longer. First company which came here was 96, I think, is a Panasonic. Then Toyota came 2002. Then if we look at the regionally, Japanese FDI in Europe started late, nine, late 80s and 90s, mostly like a factory established on Western side. Then B4 country liberalized in through 90s. Then labor cost was increasing Western side. So Japanese company are very interested in investing in this area, especially lower value products. High value products still they can sustain Western side, but I, um, for Central European countries, uh, cheaper products was ideal location because labor cost is cheap. And uh, therefore, big Japanese companies, they don't have a sales office in this country. So for example, Toyota. They, they produce he car here, then send it to Belgium, head to their headquarters. Then Japanese FDI statistic is uh, quite in this way distorted. Lots of FDI data the FDI, Japanese FDI, including Belgian or Holland or British, not directly from Japan. Some company, they make investment from Japan. So this, this like uh, investment statistic doesn't reflect the real situation. That's, that's a, um, um, uh, like a, this issue, this, this issue exists. Then Korean case, Korean case, they came around 2007 or 8, Hyundai Motors, then lots of automotive related investment. Then their investment come from Korea probably directly from Korea to here, because they didn't establish their network in the Western side. So, so that's, that's a quite big difference in those three countries. Then, and today, so I will talk about a bit more micro issues of Japanese corporation, how they operate in Czech Republic. Culture is different, and, it, uh, and so on. So um, this, like, uh, we also, with Professor Shikora, and we did, like, a survey research in 2016 in, Czech, in this Czechia, Japanese companies. Then we use um, framework of it's called the ja uh, Japanese Multinational Enterprise Study Group Template. Like uh, there are lots of studies of Japanese management or FDI transfer. Then it's a uh, if we look at the literatures until 90s, it's argument two argument. One type of study is saying oh Japanese management system can be trans transferable. Then the other study, like especially British Japanization studies, what they are saying is extremely limited because culture is different. So cannot use Japanese system. So this kind of debate existed. Then around the 90s, after mid 90s to 2000s, 
there is a dislike a、um, ab abos studies group. They start looking. It's called hybrid study, hybridization approach. It's saying how much like a aspect Japanese management can be used in host country. Host country has own culture, Japanese culture. How much? So this kind of like analysis. Then、um, we we did like、uh, we asked Professor Abo、um, to to use his framework basically. Then we conducted survey in che Czechia in 2016. Then we targeted、um, Japanese Chamber of Commerce member firms, manufacturing firm. So 2016 there are there were 54 firms. So we distributed all questionnaires. Then we we got like a 22 qualified. Um, answers. Then also we visited、um, five farms and、uh, we met those interviews and CEOs. Then this is a, like a Japanese companies、um, reply reasons or how do they view Czech Republic, competitive factors, and also why like they are establishing a farm. So one is lowest, five is highest. Then competitive factors. Actually, three factors are important. First is a location. This is like a central European location is very attractive for producers to distribute. Then also infrastructure issue, like industrial park. Then labor skill. Check like a historical this industrial、um, history. It's a high labor skill. Then, but the uncompetitive factor, on the other hand, is a labor availability is a big issue. I think currently even worse, two percent unemployment rate. It's quite difficult to get labor operators, especially. Then domestic market is quite small, so cannot. It's not attractive actually for domestic market. So pretty much is actually this region is a country to produce for Japanese companies. So then export. Then also、uh, mo um, motives for establishing farm are same geographical advantage, then supply to EU and the sales in the Western European side, I think, and so on. So then, if we look at the, like a labor cost issues, this is a、um, 2000 to 2018s. Most of Japanese company came here is around 2002. At the time, its labor cost was like three euro for three check case was four euros probably around there. Now it's more than three times. That's a situation. So wage increase is quite rapid. Last 15 years, I would say. Then this is another indicator. World Economic Forums. That's a assessment of payment and productivity, salary and productivity. Check case actually slightly position decreased from 2016 to 18. This is a max point of seven. Then check、um, Czechia was 4.7 in 2016, but 2018 4.5. Then this is a global ranking. It's a 2008. 34. So still like a very attractive location, I can say. Like wage is relatively high, but productivity is quite good in this country. But it's changing. Then、uh, the overview of this Japanese investment. So what I use was、uh, like a Czech investor day. Investment date in 2015, so that's only I heard before. So,、um, the, Japan is a, was the second largest FDI provider in the country, basically after Germany. Then in 2019, so seven, 279 Japanese farm are operating, over 50,000 um, employment they created. Then、uh, manufacturing sector is、uh, about 110. And also important issue: three farms are engaged in research and development in Czech Republic, which are not happened in Hungary actually, and maybe not Slovakia either. And then all Japanese investments, mostly manufacturing sector, greenfield investment, meaning is that they buy, they bought land, establish factory, employ people. This type of FDI. So. 
significantly contribute to the economy of Czechia in this way. Then, in terms of membership of Japan Chamber of Commerce of Industry, Czechia is the fourth biggest member they have. So. Then, this is a, our um, surveys firm. So, 22 firms, but automotive is a most like a, 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 I got, we got replied, but the automotive is the most significant, I would say, um, sectors in Czechia. Also, actually, Hungary, too. Then type of business establishment year. Then if you look at the ownership, EU 100%, those companies are very famous, big companies. Then capital are not coming from Japan. So. The smaller firms, they might come from Japan, actually. That's, that's a Japanese FDI trend in Czechia. Then this is a hybrid evaluation. So one, one, five is the same as the Japanese system. One is zero, no Japanese system. So how do they evaluate? Then we use like a four um, aspect, work organization and administration, production control, group consciousness, labor relations, then parent subsidies relations and the procurement issues. So five is Japan, same as Japan. One is totally local. This is a, this is a, like a result. Then key findings is, a, anyway, production control showed the highest figure. So production um, control can be used quite high level in, Oh, okay. Um, in Czech Republic, then work organization group consciousness about 50% of Japanese method system. Labor relation is the lowest, less than 50%. Then I will just talk about like uh, important points of those like uh, uh, results. So, um, the wedge system, Japanese like a work organization and administration, Japanese wedge system is very different. It's a, may, maybe lots of people are not familiar with, but Japan is a seniority system. Salary is based on age, including university. I'm working for university, my university salary is based on age. Every year when we become old, salary increment like that. So this is a typical like a Japanese system. And then also, so then lifetime employment system, another point. Generally speaking, it's changing nowadays, but it's a, once we get job, we work same old company until retirement. That's a quite common practice in Japan. Those two elements are um, significant in Japanese companies. Then um, the, in European case, Interesting point is a uh, Europe wage system is determined by job type. Another issue, this is a salary like a structure. European, like uh, I think uh, most of people, you are from Czech Republic. So like a marketing department and IT department, human resource department, the base salary is different, I think in many European country. But in Japan, it's the same. It's the same. Marketing department, administration department, Everywhere is the same. So that's a Japanese wage system. So Japanese like a company need to adjust this kind of payment system. The reason why the Japanese are based on the seniority system, age and the lifetime employment system, but the European country is different. So th therefore, um, it's quite different. Then another very important issue is a job rotation system in Japanese organization. Job rotation system is under Japanese organizations Japanese worker change duties every three to five years. We, let's say one person start marketing department first three, five years. They might go to human resource department, maybe accounting department. So rotate all the jobs. They even, eventually, once like Japanese people become a manager, they know all operations. That's a Japanese system based on lifetime employment system. So experience all type of jobs. That's a typical like a, then this kind of job rotation system in Czech Republic case is extremely difficult to use. 
uh, and this is our survey result is about 50% they use mul mul multiple skilling, meaning is a, um, this kind of job rotation may experience many type of jobs. Then, but the clear difference exists the production side. Still majority, um, majority company use, I think, um, production side. Could be like a machinery engineering divisions, the maintenance divisions, and so on. So they cycle, rotate in this kind of job. But administrative side is extremely difficult because it's an education system and professionalism. This kind of like a issue, like a, um, uh, issue exists in Czech Republic. So it's very difficult to shift people. So Japanese company cannot use in this way to train people. Then second issue is the production control. Production control is the highest anyway. Then, and, but uh, it's a slight difference. The first difference is automation ratio. Is uh, of course Japan is nowadays Japan labor cost is decreasing, but still high. So um, automation ratio is higher than here. But the Czech case is a uh, labor cost is increasing, so they are shifting now, adjusting more automations, actually, industrial 4.0, therefore it's important. Then second issue is the machinery itself is uh, still main equipment uh, the Japanese company are using uh, made in Japan, import. But the peripheral machinery, uh, Czech is, uh, is famous like a uh, historically industrial country, machinery industry, you have a very high level. So Japanese company using uh, peripheral machinery, they are using local machineries. Then just in time, just in time is a, actually only 59% of farms are using. The reason why is a non-automotive sector they don't use. Then even automotive sectors, company which are supplying to European or American company, they don't use. So we, we visited actually one factory. Is a stock space is very different in sending to Ford and Toyota. Huge like a uh, difference. So it uh, depends on company. But uh, if they deal with uh, European American companies, they have a huge stock. And the Japanese only like uh, supplying Japanese company, then they use just in time. Then third issue is group consciousness. And uh, the, another important issue is that this is also a Japanese system, but we call the QC circle. It's a quality control circle which is uh, when we finish job, let's say five o'clock, then five to once a week, 30 minutes, we discuss how to improve our workplace, voluntarily, no pay. Generally, some company pay, some company don't, but generally speaking, 30 minutes meetings every week. Then how like we enhance safety, so how we enhance productivities. This kind of like a group activity, then once a year, we have an award. Every, every month, like we propose, we improve this way. We call it somehow Kaizen, work term is a Kaizen uh, improvement. This kind of uh, like a practice are uh, conducted as a group unit. Then uh, the Czech case is extremely difficult to use. Czech people don't like it, culture, this one. Um, so interesting case is a Toyota case. Toyota factory all over the world. <clears throat> um, people who are engaged in this QC circle activities are about 80 to 90 percent of Toyota or employees. That's a global people are um, you, like, uh, conducting this kind of um, QC circle, engaged in QC circle. But check case is the lowest in the Toyota factory, only 30 to 40 percent. Then, um, but Interesting issue is uh, completion ratio is highest in Toyota factory too. Once Czech people commit, very good, high, 100%. So th this is a, like a bit of cultural issue exists in this one. This is like a uh, practice. Then successful like a company we visited is a, like a Daikin industry. They produce air conditioning in Pilsen. Then they put like all country flag, what they improve. So this is like a production system they improved, then they, they made in Thailand. They, this idea was 
developed in Thailand, they put the Thai flag. The American was the American flag, the Czech, Czech farm. So all the Daikin factory in the world, they put flag, how they improve, who, which country they decide. So stimulating some like a competition, some kinds of. So then, uh, then like a Daikin case was quite successful in this way, actually. Then labor relations. Labor relations is a quite also different. Japanese company don't fire, generally speaking. So, but um, quite big also um, similarity is the union issues. Japan, like uh, we have a company unions. We don't have a trade unions. All like uh, automotive industry, automotive union exist. Like uh, many Western country, Western European country, or. United States. But Japanese one is a labor union, is a Toyota, Nissan, Honda separated. Then Czech case is a, actually union density is very low, first of all. People don't belong to unions. The reason why it's a de facto to communist party in the past too. So, so but um, the Japanese farms, they are quite new. Around 2002, they came to Czech, Czech Republic. No, Union, so they are organizing similar to Japanese union style, company union, better than nothing actually. So this this kind of like a um, relation, um, uh, human relation uh, exists. Then parent subsidies issues. This is a more like a, it's quite difficult to evaluate, but this is the Japanese workers. We we in twenty two farms. A total employees is uh, 14,000 workers about. Then 154 Japanese are working. Then 139 are expert. Then 15 are locally hired Japanese staff. That's uh, like uh, less than 1%. I don't know if this ratio is high or low, but th this is a ratio. Then 6.3 workers per farm. That's uh, according to our result. But uh, CEOs, only two CEOs out of 22. This is uh, quite maybe low. So CEOs are Japanese, mostly. Then this is a more interesting information, managers' nationalities. So Czech, foreign is a mostly Japanese, then both. So th this is a, like a percent of a, like a local managers. The managers, um, production-related divisions, uh, Generally speaking, Czech managers, not Japanese. Then sales department, the lowest. The reason why it's a local manager, they are developing with local like uh, suppliers, normally local companies they are dealing with, and also European. Then Japanese side is a second tier suppliers. Let's say, sorry, not second, first tier suppliers. They have to deal with Japanese assembler, so therefore they need a Japanese still manager. Then large. Company, as I mentioned, like a Toyota, they don't have a marketing department because it's uh, conducted in European headquarters, not here. So here is just a simply production location. So then this is a, another um, figure of local management. Five is a, like a Japanese, also or, or Japanese have power. Then level one is a Czech case. Mostly like a level four is a. Um, majority of important position held by Japanese. That's 36% or equal distribution, Japan, the Czech. This is a, like a, a survey result. Then decision making, five is Japan, one is local. So decision making are more local, I would say. However, they need permission from Japan headquarters, plan everything. They decide, but uh, they need approval from headquarters. That's that's a quite common practice in Japanese farm. Then um, localization effort. The Japanese company try to localize more, giving uh, like a local authority, authority to the local people. That's a, that's a, like a Japanese practice at the moment in this country. Then two reasons why the cost will be lower because sending Japanese stuff is too expensive simply. Then another issue is also cultural issues. If we give a, like a decision making um, power to the local, they, they, they have more responsibility. So, so the Japanese company is shifting that way. Then 
Um, one of the reasons is uh, also like a Czech culture, according to our analysis. Not only me, I'm Japanese, so I cannot say that. <laughs> and Czech, Czech has a, you know, it's an Austrian Hungarian empire, then Soviet Union. So generally speaking, it's a Czech are often skeptical to foreign models, foreign decision making imposed by foreigners. So that's, that's that kind of issue exists. So that's, that's like uh, our explanation. So situation is the Japanese companies are difficult. So they have to give uh, authority, shifting authority to local like uh, managers. Then this is uh, like a case studies of ACZ a is uh, automotive suppliers. Then this company was established in 2002. Then until 2011, I think 11, it's all managers are Japanese. But what's happened is a local people, local, like uh, Czech people, didn't like this kind of decision making process or companies like organizations. So they could not do business anymore. So what they did is uh, they change, replace all managers with Czech people, except for CEO. President is Japanese, rest are all Czech people. Then what's the role of Japanese? It's a Jap role of Japanese is actually coordinators. So they, they don't decide, Lo local manager decide, but just giving advice, supportive roles. So that's, that's a, like a Japanese workers in this company. So it's like a Japanese companies, their uh, organizational structure is changing in this way, in this country. Then lastly, this procurement. Then, like a uh, procurement, there are two big like uh, issue. One is the uh, electronics industry. Actually, they source lots of material from Asia. Simply in Europe, they cannot find the cheap input material because uh, electronics cluster existed in Asia: China, Taiwan, Thailand, Japan. So much cheaper to source from there. European like uh, input is difficult. Then automotive sector. Is a, is a big problem actually exists. It's a big, one big issue is that industrial standard is different. Japanese company are using JIS, Japan industrial standard, then European standard. Simply, if you like a car company especially want to change materials, this like a validation, um, verifying like a period is a minimum six months, quite often two years, just to change materials. So this kind of testing process is quite long. So it's quite difficult to enhance local like contents in this way, local materials. So that's that's a, like a, so this is a localized um, number of companies, suppliers of 17 companies. That you can see, local companies are 100% Czech-owned company. Then Japanese firm in Czech or non-Japanese, that's a mostly Europeans, I would say. So this is the situation. So uh, Park Farm, 53 companies they are dealing, supplier they are. Then this is a local content. Actually in Czech content, 0 to 19 is uh, quite big actually. It's quite low actually, in fact. Um, especially I'm talking about, let's say, suppliers, com car component producer, their materials quite often come from the other country, not local. Then procurement method, how they pro, uh, procure that the Japanese way is, uh, this is a, Czech is a local, <laughs> case of local firm, foreign is a more European, I think, than Japanese. So this is just, I will skip this. Then co conclusion, sorry. Um, production control anyway is the most um, easiest, highest like uh, adaptability performance actually they show. Then work organization and group consciousness and labor relations is quite difficult because of culture is quite different. And also like uh, history is different too. Then value, education system. So then uh, strong this kind of cultural environment, how like a company can change in this kind of behavior is uh, actually overseas training is most useful. Sending manager to Japan or neighboring country, how they do it. Then, then they, they become a supporter. 
Then um, also like a Czech company, but uh, more recently I visited the uh, Denso is one of the biggest car supplier, car parts supplier in the world, in Hungary. They employed over 4,000 people. Um, this company, they send four families, whole family to Japan, rotate. So including family, they understand the Japanese culture or companies' operations. Those people return from Japan, then they, they know how to do it, or which, which like, elements are more useful or not. So, they, so this kind of like overseas training is the most useful way to change, uh, like uh, to use the Japanese system or to compromise or, or hybrid, I would say, create a hybrid system. Then challenge is a uh, local CEO is quite still low in Japanese organizations. So that's like a company that maybe they are changing, but they need the business strategy, I think. So then procurement issues is the local contents ratio is quite low. This is a standard difference. So that's a unification of the system is necessary. That's a more political or like a, um, involvement might be necessary. So. So this is uh, the end of uh, presentation. So this paper is that uh, we print it out on the outside. So if you are interested in, also I can send, but uh, um, published in Asia Europe journal, so quite recently. So um, the, thank you for your attention then. Well, thank you, uh, Carol, for your very detailed analysis of the micro uh, micro level of uh, uh, the Japanese Czech uh, relations. Uh, well, we all the day we are discussing the cooperation between the states, uh, agents between uh, some some partnerships and cooperation, and that's the case study how the real, I mean, people to people diplomacy uh, can serve or act. Uh, well, I have uh, one uh, very short comment. You have mentioned the, the rare case of Aoyama, who completely uh, changed uh, or replaced uh, the Japanese expats by uh, Czech uh, uh, local managers. Uh, there is uh, some reason why and why the only Aoyama did it. Uh, well, my opinion is that, uh, first of all, Aoyama is a, a family ownership or family-based uh, uh, company. Uh, so it's uh, owned by Aoyama family. And so it's very uh, easy to make some uh, very I mean, strong mm. decision. So they do not need such uh, decision making. I mean, temawashi or temawashi, yeah, some, yeah. something like a discussion. And the other one is that particularly uh, the Aoyama did a very detailed, I mean, uh, cultural market research before uh, coming to the Czech Republic. I mean, Mr. Aoyama, I mean, the president of, of the company, uh, visited several times Czech Republic and just uh, make a very deep uh, uh, how to say research, personal research uh, on the. Uh, on, on the cultural background and on the way of thinking of the Czech people. I met him several times and he asked me about uh, the very, I mean, hist historical background of, of the Czech Republic. So he was, he were, uh, I mean, the company was very good prepared uh, for uh, just operating in the completely culturally different environment. And that's why uh, they, uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, did very well. And uh, I mean, that uh, particularly uh, the employee in, the, in this company are very proud to, to work here because it's so, so, such, something like a family like uh, relations between the, the company and uh, the employer. Uh, so it's the, it's the one very, I mean, uh, additional comment to, uh, to this. He was an uh, yeah. advisor. So. <laughs> This well, company, yeah. she's an establishment. So, <laughs> so um, if you have any questions or comments, and yes. Hello, my name is Irini Pietri. On behalf of the uh, Greek embassy, I'm studying economics, so I hope one day I will call myself colleague of you. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a yeah. very interesting research, and I would like to ask that you were describing some difficulties uh, between those countries, and uh, you gave an example that I thought, uh, while, you, while you were speaking, I was speaking that 
those problems might be solved if the border of a company is mixed culture. But as you said, it didn't work. Uh, do you personally believe that mm, these problems might potentially be solved, like after some years, if they keep on uh, mix their borders? Maybe this was only a random example. Do you believe that those cult cultures can be working together normally and effective, uh, efficiently? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think uh, there is uh, some points we like uh, we can uh, somehow maybe it's a negative term, but a compromise. But a compromise meaning is this is a hybrid points. I think then certain like a uh, point exist. So eventually, like uh, we can cooperate in a good <coughs> ways, but. Again, like a uh, Japanese like uh, system exists and the host country culture exists. Then this culture is a Czechia, Hungary is a different. So, so it's a case by case. Then sometimes law is different. Country law is different too. So, so we, we have to adjust that definitely. Then um, that we have to find like a points so we can work effectively. I think. So that's that's a. Uh, uh, my answer, I think. Well, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Uda. Anyway, thanks to Kaoru and Jan and all the co-authors on the pretty good piece of research. And for, for us, uh, really excellent overview how such a, a foreign uh, foreign companies or Asian foreign companies may work in, in Czech Republic because for me it's uh, actually a mystery but to myself because I have never visited uh, such the such the Asian own on the production production uh, 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 places um, I have just two very short questions. Uh, uh, have the Japanese companies mm -hmm. experienced any dispute with, with the staff because of whatever reason? And secondly, how it how it works with the with the final final products that are leaving the company uh, about the uh, registration? Do they bear the made in Czechia label or is, how is it included in the Czech Czech export statistics? This, this is my my concern because we need we need to to keep the good balance of of foreign trade because of understandable reasons. So, so all the, all actu actually the Toyotas produced here, the, uh, the, the sale is managed in the sales office in Brussels, but the cars do, do they keep the made in Czechia the label? Yeah, thank you. I think in terms of a trade statistic, if you export from Czechia to Belgium, it's, it's going to check like export side. And but uh, like uh, in terms of business, it's a uh, Belgian handled or distribution. So that's that's uh, quite a lot of big Japanese company are doing this way. Um, then sorry, first question was so this is second question I guess. Disputes. Uh, disputes. Uh, 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 dispute. I think. Uh, yeah. He, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Shigura knows yeah. more than me. He always solved this kind of problem in How here. So, well, yeah. uh, well, uh, such comment to the to the second uh, answer. Uh, all these, almost all these production uh, Japanese companies in the in the field of production is the Czech legal body. So it's not the Japanese companies. It's Japanese Japanese owned company, but due to the Czech law, is uh, the Czech uh, registered Czech uh, I mean legal body. So uh, the uh, the uh, export uh, is. Uh, Accounted into the uh, our I mean statistics, so it's uh, not the re re export and something like this. And as for the uh, the uh, the uh, well uh, well misunderstandings or some disputes is concerned. It depends. Uh, there are some very uh, where very strange uh, situation. I was invited uh, once uh, to help uh, as an interpreter uh, to help in one of uh, Japanese company. Uh, 
because they experience outflow of the administrative uh, staff. And uh, the problem was uh, the identification with the company. Uh, because uh, the first, uh, I mean, problem was uh, the secretary of the general uh, manager or the, or the president. Uh, because when she uh, went, for example, to post the office, uh, she completely uh, changed her dress to, to the civil one. Because when, the, when, the, when the, the, the workers, including the administrative staff, staff, are on the spot, just in the factory, they used uh, the uniform. It means not, not so much uh, dress, you know, I, mean, uh, I mean gray or shadow one, and with the boots, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, prescribed. And when she went to um, the post office, I mean, outside uh, uh, the factory, she redressed uh, just in, into the I mean, ordinary dress. And uh, well, the president just stopped her, and you are leaving home? Or asked, no, 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 I'm going to the post. So why, why you are you redressing? Uh, and she just uh, <laughs> mentioned that the, I cannot just go outside with such a, uh, well, strange uh, dress. And uh, he uh, answered, so uh, you are not proud on our company? Uh, and you are in, it, 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 it's a working time. So there is no need to change your dress when you go to, even outside. So that was the clash of, of the cultural I mean, aspects. And uh, the problem was resolved uh, with the understanding on both sides. Uh, so as uh, Kauru mentioned, the compromise so, was done and everything was perfect. So, so it's from time to time is the misunderstanding and, uh, and the lack of knowledge about uh, the, I mean, non-speaking, non-pronounced or non-explicated, non uh, I mean, the cultural uh, backgrounds, I mean. Yeah. Well, any other questions? Yes, please, Mr. Hosoda. Thank you very much, Natsuda Sensei. I would like to just a uh, very simple question. During you explained the uh, uh, QC activities, you used the uh, example of TPCA. But as far as I know, TPCA is not just uh, you know Toyota company or Japanese company. It's a joint venture between Japan, it's Toyota, and the Peugeot Stroen Group, right? So in the sense, uh, the lower uh, participation ratio of the Czech workers in the QC activity is influenced from this uh, Czech nationality or character of the Czech nationality, or other factors from influence of the Peugeot Stroen groups? Uh, not the strong influence of Peugeot Stroen group, because of production is a Toyota side. Mm -hmm. So it's, they have a clear distinction exist, fun functions. Peugeot Stroen was a finance, I think, and uh, some kind of procurement in related activities. But all productions are all conducted by Toyota side, so they use Toyota production system. So it's, a, it's a simply like a cultural issue, not only um, TPCA, all like uh, components, producers have uh, facing the same problem. <laughs> yeah, in this way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, any other question? I mean, the last one, because uh, the time is uh, squeezing and we still have a last presentation. So if no one, so thank you once again for your presentation. And uh, we do have the last, I mean, the last, the best. <laughs> and the last presenter is uh, Robert Marcel from uh, Slovakia. Uh, he's a research fellow uh, at the Central European Institute of Asian Studies, and also mm -hmm. he teaches at the uh, 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 yes, University in uh, Banská Bystrica. And his field of study is international affairs uh, and international relations. So, so good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, firstly I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a a uh, great honor and a uh, challenge to uh, present my comments uh, in front of uh, such, an, uh, such experts in panels and uh, in auditorium as well. Actually, it's freaking me out. So uh, thank you for uh, an introduction, Mr. Sikora. Um, I specialize on Japanese uh, foreign and security policy, uh, especially in the region of uh, East Asia, however, uh, in recent months, I'm, I'm shifting more towards uh, Japan uh, uh, relation towards uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, given some, some projects. 
uh, I'm, I'm working on, uh, actually. I would like to deliver a presentation on Slovak-Japanese relations in a context, uh, in context of EU-Japan uh, connectivity. Therefore, I would also like to thank to Professor Matuda and our Slovak authorities for not giving him the data. <laughs> Uh, so he didn't didn't uh, talk about uh, Japan-Slovak relations uh, uh, that much. Oh, okay. Uh, Slovak-Japan relations. Uh, actually, as we as we commemorate 100 years of diplomatic relations between our nations, it is time not only to uh, reflect on our past achievements. It is uh, also time to set up some strategies for, let's say, next 100 years, or at least a few decades. Uh, we have to acknowledge the role of, uh, of uh, Japan in, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, uh, our, um, probably the most notable uh, politician of that era, Mr. Stefanik, spent uh, some time in, uh, in Japan while coordinating uh, Japanese support for uh, our Czechoslovakian legions fighting in, in uh, Siberia at the time. Uh, afterwards, uh, as Mr. Kolmash already mentioned, geog geographical distance and uh, geopolitical uh, reality of, of the time separated our nations. And uh, 100 years after, we are standing here and we are actually enjoying uh, being partners again. Uh, and probably the quality of uh, this relation is better than uh, ever before. Japan was also one of the first uh, states that acknowledged existence of independent Slovakia in 1993. And since then, uh, we've been working on our relation on all levels. And I, miss, I, I can say there's a positive trend of uh, of uh, mutual uh, visits uh, among uh, our top uh, representatives trying to make the most of, of this relation. And we are, de indefinitely, uh, we are definitely in need for uh, future-oriented relations. Uh, distance is uh, not the only problem uh, we face. Uh, we should be fully aware of uh, the position uh, that Slovakia has uh, in, 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 uh, regarding, regarding its uh, relation to, to Japan. Uh, some trends were already mentioned, but uh, Slovak economy is uh, not uh, that competitive as it was, let's say, 20 years ago. Uh, our workforce is becoming, uh, our workforce is becoming um, uh, expensive. Uh, the business environment in uh, Slovakia is kind of struggling as well. Uh, and we lack absolvents of technical fields. So actually research and development in Slovakia is really, uh, is really performing poorly, even in comparison with uh, within V4 countries. Well, uh, Slovakia is an export-oriented and rather small country in Central Europe is obviously integrated in all possible structures, uh, uh, enhancing not only trade cooperation, but providing uh, security and protection. And this gives us another layers to Slovak-Japanese relations. And I'm, I will speak uh, about three of those, uh, bilateral relations, V4 plus Japan relations and EU Japan uh, relations. So, the bilateral are mostly economic and definitely one sided uh, relations. I would add also uh, value based as well. Uh, it is understandable that due to enormous uh, economic uh, inequality in terms of economic power, Slovakia has been. Uh, rather a passive receiver of uh, benefits in form of uh, foreign direct investments uh, over the brief time of its uh, existence. There are uh, more than 60 companies operating in Slovakia and they created uh, approximately 13,000 uh, jobs. 
the, the number uh, the number varies uh, according to different sources, but it's between 13 to 15,000 uh, jobs. Japan is actually second biggest Asian investor in Slovakia, right after uh, South Korea. Uh, if we are talking about some uh, investments or successful companies from Slovakia uh, that uh, that uh, are in Japan, uh, I, I'm thinking only about one success story, and it's an uh, asset company, it's an uh, IT company, and I think it was one of the fastest growing IT companies in Japan in the last 15 years, actually. But uh, none other example uh, comes to my mind when I'm speaking about uh, some direct, uh, some investments coming from Slovakia uh, to Japan. On political level, relations are obviously generally good. Uh, it might be a little surprising that Slovakia has one of uh, the top UN voting alignment out of uh, European Union and the very best from uh, V4 countries. Uh, it amazes me how this landlocked uh, country uh, with five million people have uh, more in common uh, with Japan than, for example, uh, Poland or even Czech Republic. Um, however, there are many, there are not many uh, examples of political cooperation uh, on the bilateral basis among Slovakia and Japan. Also, uh, quality of parliamentary diplomacy between uh, Slovakia and Japan is. Uh, I would say questionable. Uh, there's, there's a group uh, of Slovak-Japanese partnership in, 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 uh, in Slovak parliament. And after, after it was led by uh, Mr. Shebe, who was somehow involved within uh, Karate Association and so on, uh, now it's led by, or it was led by really unknown uh, a politician or MP of Hungarian nationality who communicated only in Hungarian. Therefore, you can imagine that the, uh, that the results of parliamentary diplomacy uh, and uh, the promo uh, promoting uh, Japan-Slovak relation uh, was uh, rather poor. Um, same goes, and also the quality of parliamentary diplomacy uh, compared to China. Or, or compared to, uh, to the one of uh, Taiwan uh, is uh, really poor uh, from, from Japanese side as well. Uh, lately, China took uh, 10 of our MPs uh, for a visit. They just uh, took them around to China. It was great PR. Like 10 of our MPs are visiting China. They saw uh, some, some industries. Uh, they saw uh, many uh, positive pictures uh, of, of Chinese reality, reality. And uh, it was all over, the, all over the news. There's nothing like that going on with Japan. Uh, and also cultural diplomacy. Sometimes it's uh, really counterproductive uh, in, uh, in Slovakia. I mean, uh, cultural diplomacy is obviously emphasizing the traditional Japanese narratives of uh, country of samurais and, and geishas and, uh, and and bonsai and all those all those things that that come uh, that uh, come up to your mind. Uh, I would I would share my experience with with this uh, uh, very interesting aspect. Uh, I was covering a state visit of President uh, Chaputova in Japan uh, during the intronization ceremony. And beside this uh, official and uh, ceremonial uh, program, she met uh, Shinzo Abe. She went to uh, TEPCO uh, energetic company and uh, had some discussions on sustainable development in this sector. They also um, visited some companies that uh, uh, deal with uh, green tech which is a kind of a core topic of, uh, of our president uh, currently. And all the, all the, all the questions uh, they've been asking were, is the Japanese emperor still considered a living god? 
there's like no push to present Japan as a, as a modern uh, country with uh, uh, high-tech uh, patents and so on, and, 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 uh, and mostly as, as an economical partner in Slovakia. There's no push for that. Oh. Um. Thank you. Okay, V V for Japan. Mm -hmm. V for post Japan format. Uh, probably, uh, I, I have to I have to uh, say that uh, I totally agree with Mr. Kolmaj and ninety nine percent of what he said. However, we def uh, I I. Uh, the outcome for me is uh, quite different. Uh, as, as, I, as I, I think uh, about uh, cooperation within B4 and Japan, Japan format as a challenge, and uh, Mr. Komash probably sees uh, at, uh, this cooperation as an, as an obstacle. Uh, however, along with Western Balkans, B4 is the only functional uh, partner for Japan in terms of regional cooperation. Uh, I think, in a way, it substitutes uh, lack of strategy uh, for our region, for broader region of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, if, we, if you compare it with China, they have this 17 plus 1 initiative. Yet, that might be not uh, working, it might be not like a uh, straight, straightforward uh, strategy. Uh, however, it is at least uh, something. Uh, I have to uh, strongly agree on diverse quality of relations with Japan within V4. Uh, the, 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 the chart that was showed uh, regarding the, uh, the FDI inflow into V4 countries, uh, I think that uh, state the, or, or the low inflow of uh, investment in uh, Slovakia was uh, mainly due to uh, a rule of Vladimir Mechiar in the 90s. Because of, because of the uh, business environment was uh, really unstable and unpredictable, and also because uh, Slovak uh, authorities were trying to push uh, their own um, Slovak way of transformation, uh, which was kind of... Uh, uh, different from the one that uh, uh, that went through in Czech Republic, for example. And also, uh, on, the, on, the, on the note about uh, competition between V4 countries, uh, it's, it is a problem, definitely. We are competitors in uh, trying to, to bring uh, as much uh, foreign direct investment into our countries as we can. However, uh, we shouldn't forget the bigger picture. Uh, if we are talking about some infrastructure development, uh, I think there's, uh, there's definitely a space for a cooperation uh, um, among V4 nations. Um, another problematic aspect is, of course, uh, that V4 has an image of troublemaker uh, in the EU. Uh, it is more of kind of a labor union uh, for our countries in Brussels uh, than a creative and constructive partner for the rest of the EU. And this is probably the biggest challenge for us to change uh, this perception and make uh, Visegrad Group a reliable partner, not only for EU, but also for, um, for uh, countries outside of the EU, such as Japan, and to push a kind of a more positive agenda, bringing up ideas and uh, creative solutions for, for challenges we are facing. And last, uh, last level is the EU-Japan level of cooperation. Um, well, obviously, we have been witnessing uh, increasing cooperation between EU and Japan, uh, especially after uh, TPP failed, as I was uh, in Japan in 2016, I spoke to Professor Urata from uh, Waseda University, and he, he insisted that TPP 
is a cornerstone of, uh, of Japanese ambition to de deliver uh, an economic growth. Uh, however, Mr. Trump in the White House, it seems to be uh, impossible, and therefore Japan uh, turned for the very next logical partner in spearheading the free trade and economic and multilateral cooperation, and it was the EU. Uh, we've seen uh, implement, uh, signing an uh, economic partnership agreement, a uh, strategic part partnership agreement, and partnership on uh, sustainable development and quality mm -hmm. infrastructure. Uh, SPA covers a broad range of areas we might collaborate in. We've heard a lot about uh, defense. Uh, there are, many of them are really vaguely formated, uh, formulated. Uh, as far as I know, there are several areas on the table at this very moment. Uh, environmental agenda, uh, healthcare, transportation, uh, development policy, and culture as well. Uh, however, particular project are not to be publicized yet. We have to wait for uh, some further, stray, uh, further, further stage of development of those projects uh, to be publicized. Uh, Reactive Japan, well, in very traditional manner, uh, Japan is waiting for us uh, to come with ideas about possible uh, possible cooperation, possible projects. Uh, it is totally understandable that uh, as a single state party in this partnership, uh, they expect some, some, some outcomes and proposals from 27 counterparts. On the other hand, uh, it might uh, kind of prove the lack of deeper uh, strategic approach especially towards Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, I also find it, uh, this SPA, partially irrelevant for Central European uh, and Eastern European countries, or Visegrad 4 as well. Let me elaborate. Uh, in a sense, the SPA is oriented on Western powers that have certain capabilities to project uh, and implement its uh, foreign policy uh, tools and its foreign policy uh, intentions, um, even outside of the EU. For example, check the diplomatic blue, blue book of uh, Japanese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. How many comments are there on Visegrad 4 or uh, Central and Eastern Europe? Not that many. Uh, was some, there were some uh, brief mentions about uh, V4 plus Japan summit, of course, but still, when compared to even Spain, the V4 seems to, when, and Central Europe seems to be less relevant for Japan. Uh, EPA, uh, unfulfilled promise for Slovakia? Probably yes. Uh, it created a giant economic powerhouse of states with shared vision of promoting free trade against tendencies of protectionism uh, in the world. However, the impact on Slovakia is not uh, that significant. Uh, there, were some, uh, there, was, there was a lot of talking about opportunities, for example, for our wine producers to expand on, uh, on a great uh, Japanese market with their products. Uh, well, we don't have capacities uh, to get into Japanese uh, uh, market. We don't produce enough wine to get there. And this goes for many other, uh, many, uh, many other sectors uh, that uh, thought that, oh, they hoped for some, some actually better result. Of course, uh, Slovakia is a pro-export-oriented uh, country. Therefore, uh, this, uh, this partnership uh, means a lot to us in terms of uh, keeping the world more uh, open in terms of, of, of trade and cooperation. Uh, 
with the uh, with the wine producers, I, I'm, I'm thinking about one similarity with with China right now. Uh, lately, like two or three months ago, uh, it was it made a huge news that uh, China approved uh, Slovak uh, approved. Uh, uh, or gave approval for Slovak uh, producers of pork meat to enter the, their market. I was like, yeah, great success. So there are, I think, three companies uh, selling pork meat to China. How, how is that relevant for our economy? It, it's not, actually. Yeah, but it made a, uh, some uh, politicians appear on a, in the news. Uh, regarding the EU-Japanese uh, connectivity. Um, Japan and the EU intend to work together on all dimensions on, of connectivity, bilaterally and multilaterally, including digital, transport, energy, and people-to-people -people exchanges. Uh, notably in the regions of Western Balkans, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Indo-Pacific, as well as uh, in Africa. This is what gives uh, Slovak-Japanese relations uh, a purpose, or a substance, if you want. Uh, it enables Slovakia to play a more active role in this relation, uh, not only to receive investments, but also to actively contribute uh, within EU-Japan cooperation framework, especially in regions of Western Balkans and Eastern Europe. I'm speaking about Eastern partnership countries, and Western Balkans. In conclusion, um, I think that V4 Plus Japan is the best available platform for cooperation. Uh, bilaterally, we, given the state of our current relations, bilaterally we wouldn't achieve much, to be honest. And within the whole EU27, uh, I think we, uh, we might get lost. And therefore, this regional cooperation uh, seems to be a solution. However, uh, I would recommend to our policymakers uh, to initiate uh, V4 transformation into respected and constructive partner, uh, not only to Japan, but also uh, to Europe. Uh, I've I'm sure that uh, at least to some, uh, some degree it's, it's uh, really possible. State of our uh, economies uh, determines our mostly passive role. It goes without saying that we will strive to attract Japanese uh, investments. Uh, we will try to be a part of every possible uh, infrastructure development project. Uh, however, given the uh, mentioned uh, overlapping interests in Western Balkans and Eastern partnership countries, I see a common sphere of interest and uh, opportunity to actively uh, contribute. Uh, Slovakia has a great expertise, in, especially in Western Balkans. Uh, we shared common history and we have a common cultural uh, background as well and long record of official uh, development assistance in those countries. Uh, therefore, we can offer uh, somehow added value uh, to whatever initiative or project uh, will be implemented in those regions under uh, EU and, uh, and Japan uh, strategic uh, partnership agreement. So that will be all. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Robert, for uh, the final presentation. And uh, the floor is open if you have any comments and questions. Or... It's very particular agenda. Uh, I have one uh, maybe silly question. You have mentioned that uh, parliamentary diplomacy is uh, on the poor level on both sides. You just uh, provided an example of the, of the uh, how to say, Slovak uh, misunderstanding. Uh, so, but uh, what, uh, what was uh, poor on the Japanese side? <laughs> so. Well, uh, 
like I'm not, I'm not saying there's like there there is no actual initiative from uh, from uh, Japanese side, uh, but it's uh, it's not something that uh, would I I would I, I wouldn't consider it being uh, overly constructive or uh, putting a like no some over effort in 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 uh, in terms of trying to improve and strengthen the relations between Slovakia and Japan mm -hmm. so you mean the passive approach from the from mm, yes the that's Japanese. what uh, that's something that's really like uh, very uh, traditional uh, mm. uh, typical for for Japanese foreign policy this this uh, passive approach most of the time so uh, I'm not that surprised mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I am more uh, likely to be uh, critical towards uh, mm -hmm. Slovakian uh, Slovakian oh, part or uh, Slovakian parliament mm -hmm. in terms of diplomacy. Oh, thanks. Well, so we still have uh, more than five minutes. So, well, I will have some encouraging comment to to Robert. I heard that Slovakia is actually the per capita top car producer, not just only in Europe but maybe in the world. Sometimes maybe that this is over, over concentration of the of the car making, but still it, it matters because it's a very, this is a very important sector. Uh, I think the the biggest investor it's in Slovakia it's South Korea. Is it right? Uh, definitely yes. Uh, there are uh, there are, there's a Samsung uh, in the, in the southern Slovakia, and uh, Kia in in Žilina. And many other uh, companies that are providing uh, particular uh, particular components, mostly for automotive uh, industry. Uh, yes, it's true that Slovakia is the uh, is the Detroit of Europe, or whatever you would like to call it. <laughs> yes, and probably that's the that's the Slovakian perspective as well to end up like Detroit. Uh, we we cannot. Uh, uh, rely on uh, cheap labor mm -hmm. and producing cars like crazy. Uh, actually, um, right now, uh, Volkswagen announced uh, that he's moving part of the production, uh, I think, to Romania because uh, labors in the factory kind of. Uh, well, the dialogue was a bit shady from from side of the labors. <laughs> Uh, therefore, uh, management uh, got angry and they decided that they will uh, move uh, part of production out of Slovakia. Uh, we are lucky that in Bratislava, uh, for example, uh, in, in Volkswagen factory, they are focusing on uh, electromobility and uh, luxurious, uh, luxurious cars like the Porsche, what is Panamera and, and, and Audi Q7 and, and so on, it's fine. Uh, also, I think uh, Kia factory in Jilina is quite prospective. Um, the last, the last manufacturer, uh, Land Rover Jaguar in Nitra, bit controversial uh, given the, the location because there is a lack of uh, labor force. So we have to invite some uh, workforce from uh, Romania and Serbia. Uh, and people on in the eastern part of the country couldn't quite get it. Uh, however, it is, yeah, we, we might be thankful to the automotive industry for uh, contribution to our economical growth. However, uh, in a few years' time, uh, it might uh, turn really ugly. Well, thank you. And the other one, yes, please. I would like to follow what you just said, that the, the scenario that it will turn ugly. So my, is there already a discussion about possible future? In um, what would happen, for example, because every motorcycle mm, f firm is pushing toward eco-friendly, like, so it will be high tech. So uh, I would I'd like to ask, um, what will change if the production which is happening right now will stop? Because 
like I think now it's still producing and uh, the old models, not like mm. electrical one. Thank you. Actually, in Bratislava, uh, there, there are uh, there's a factory line that produces those uh, Volkswagen up uh, those little electromobiles. It's I, I don't know. It's it's it probably has some future. Uh, However, the scenario for Slovakia in case of some radical change in automotive uh, industry is uh, really bad. Uh, we are talking about the need of uh, better uh, education, uh, providing a highly trained, uh, skilled uh, workforce for, uh, you know, uh, for the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution. Uh, however, we are still not able to deliver uh, reform uh, educational system. Uh, our research and development is underfunded. Uh, actually, there was one fantastic project uh, with Japanese company in uh, Košice. Uh, I, uh, yeah, a company called Minebea. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, they do have a research cooperation with Technical University in Košice. So it is one company that actually has some kind of research and development cooperation uh, in, in Slovakia, however, uh, with other uh, car producers in Slovakia, it's, it's not this case. Even in terms of uh, Kia or, or Volkswagen, we are just uh, manufacturing those cars. No value added is it's, it's happening in, in Slovakia, actually. Well, thank you. I mean that the time is just over. Uh, if you have any questions, so we, we can continue in the last part. I mean, after the uh, coffee break, we will have still one hour for the final remarks and final discussion. Uh, so we will meet uh, again at half past three. Well, thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention and see you. Oh,